It's my great honor and privilege to introduce the keynote speaker for today, uh, a mentor and friend. Uh, I've known Pat since uh, the early days in Dallas. That goes back into the early 1980s. Uh, and Pat is, of course, one of the founders of uh, archetypal psychology. She was there prior to that in the late 60s, early 70s in Zurich as this whole movement began. And in fact, she was married to James Hillman for uh, more than two decades. Um, so she has, she's really at the core, the root of one of the most important traditions that the school operates out of. She's a Jungian analyst who was trained in Zurich. Uh, she was actually the first uh, visiting scholar we had at Pacifica here back in 1991. Uh, so she launched that program for us. Um, she's most known, her book is Echo's Subtle Body, a contribution to archetypal psychology. And then more recently, a bunch of articles, Image in Motion, Rules of Thumb, A Little Light, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, The Impure Salt. So you get a wide range. She's been a slam poet uh, in terms of creativity and, <laughs> and performance. Yeah, she's, she's quite gifted. Um, and actually in Dallas, she, she got her PhD at the University of Dallas, and that was when I was first making a shift from the hard sciences over to, to psychology. And part of the way I, ma I made my living to get through that was to help spring publications. I did typesetting and things like that, and I ended up typing uh, Pat's dissertation. <laughs> 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 so we had a, a long history. She also then later on served as a supervisor when I was in analytic training. Uh, and uh, it was just a marvelous experience getting to work with her and her creativity around the use of dreams and how to use those in clinical practice. So uh, it's with great personal delight that I um, uh, offer you Pat Perry as our keynote speaker. Thanks. Thank you, Joe, very much. Don't worry, I'm not going to do any slam poetry. <laughs> I, I uh, and you see how old I am? I mean, <laughs> you know, centuries and centuries of life. And actually, I'm very much in the same position as all you at this moment because I'm trying to decide where I want to settle. Do I want to settle here at Pacifica? I'm thinking, yeah. Uh, I've, been, I've been teaching here the last couple semesters. And let me tell you firsthand, students are great. Um, they're smart. They, I'm speaking from the point of view of a teacher. They're, they challenge you. They wrestle with you. They bring in different points of view. They have their own careers, their own backgrounds, their own disasters and non-disasters and successes in their life, just as we all do. They're real people. I mean, they aren't people coming here just to spout one or another, uh, what, catchphrase. They're, they're uh, well, I can't say enough about them. I just, I just finished a couple days ago, and so I'm partly in love. Um, they bring a lot, and they help, a, they help a teacher a lot. So if you're looking for that kind of richness, that kind of diversity, uh, let me make a pitch for this school, because I'm probably going to come here for the same, re well, similar reasons. My reasons would be, um, yeah, uh, a very interesting faculty that comes from lots of different points of view. Don't go to a place that has just one point of view. I mean, we probably have four or five different ways of looking at dreams on this campus. That's good. That's good. People with backgrounds in different kinds of depth psychology, that's good. It gives you lots of, um, what, layers and ways of understanding. And you're bound to trip upon the, the one that works best in your psyche. I mean, I'm convinced that um, we have certain, this is my, I make up things. Um, it, it, we have certain theoretical bents, every bit as deep in ourselves, ways of working, ways of making sense of the world that is um, as unique as an archetype itself. I mean, it's like ways of understanding that fit us. 
And it takes time to find and sort of stand for that particular way, because sometimes it comes from a pretty strange place. Yeah, as does mine. It took, it took a long time to figure out the place where I fit best. And where I fit best is where I don't fit very well. But I can do my thing, and there's enough people who can pick up on it and get something from it in their way that it makes me somebody who's able to give to the world, which we all probably are looking for in some way or another. So we're here as uh, searchers, all of us. Let me say a word about soul, because... You know, I said we're so different, the people who, the faculty here, and yet we have certain values in common. One of them is soul. Uh, I did some research on soul the other day, and you know, it goes back to Homer. This means, it, so, I mean, you know, then, then they called it psyche. The word psyche uh, that became soul, the, all those are the same words. It's in the same line psyche, soul, anima. Back then, they didn't need to make all those differentiations. But if you look at the oral history, I mean, this is before writing, right? Oral history, they told these stories over and over again exactly the same way, according to the scholars that study this. So the word soul, for example, comes up when Achilles goes out into the battlefield uh, in the Iliad, and is, it's a moment where he probably will die. I mean, he's risking his life. It's that crucial a moment and event. And he says, oh, my psyche. So it's, it's tied with, one of the ways it's been looked at throughout history is as something that's close to death life, life and death, putting yourself on the line in that kind of on the line place. That means a lot. To me, so that and that goes with it up through. Um, it also is more generally and more often um, just about life, living things. Aristotle makes a lot of that, living things. Um, sometimes even applied to plants, bushes. You know, there are different uh, different people um, use <laughs> use references a little bit differently. Even way back then, they find a number of, of kinds of uses, and then you trace it all the way up up up, up to pre-Socratics, Aristotle. Aristotle did a lot with uh, anima, psyche, got translated as soul, and then sela, and the, when the church took over, and then it got into all sorts of church things. Which is one of the places, I say that, because it's one of the places where uh, Hillman, a Jew, um, didn't want it to go. So when he talked about soul, he liked to call it uh, the valley. And he quotes Keats, the valley of soul making. And he distinguishes it from uh, intellectual, spiritual movements, which are up. He says, those are mountaintop things. Things that go poof, like that into uh, unities. Some of you might be in, uh, familiar with integral psychology, Ken Wilber, that that kind of stuff. Um, that moves into a more spirit dimension. Actually, we've, we've got a lot in common with them up until that sort of final movement. Um, so that's just for your own differentiation. If you if you like the spiritual unity, well, you could still do that here. But there'll be other places that talk about it more. I mean, here there's more talk about life and about connecting with, um, well, the world, the soul in the world. Now, my way of contributing to that, at least in the teaching that I've done most recently, is in a very interior way because that's, that's, where, I'm, that's where I'm better, you know? I'm addicted to the news right now, so I'm very, I'm very out there. Um, but uh, I don't feel like there's anything that I can contribute at this moment, except show up at rallies, except you know, show up in protest, except do whatever any of us could do, which is not much at the moment. So my notion is that is to affect, affect the world through the inside. 
One of the ways of doing that is looking at dreams, for example, since that's the field that's really important to me, uh, in a way that brackets out the ego. And I'll show you what, what I mean. In fact, I'm going to be doing a bunch of dreams a little bit later, but this is one that I have used as an example for a long time. And so this is kind of a thought experiment or an imagining experiment. And for some of you, if you people are all new, you're going to think, what the devil is she doing? I mean, in the third year students, the people are just now graduating. It took, <laughs> it took one group two times with me before they thought, oh, yeah, I get what you're doing now. Or, oh, yeah, now. Those were all clinicians, so we were doing it in a certain clinical way, too. OK, there's a, a, a motto that I uh, stick to very closely, which is everything is right in the dream, except perhaps the dream ego. This, this I, in this example dream. And this is an example dream that I got from Jean Jenlin or somebody, just so I wouldn't know who the dreamers were. So I. We always think in terms of I. We always think, you know, I feel this way, or well, from my point of view, particularly nowadays. I mean, the I has grown, whoa, you know, to kind of pathological proportions. I, me, I, me, I, me, I, me. So part of what this approach does is relativize, radically relativize the I. OK, so that's why I put it in quotes, I. I, and I would even say, I feel I need. Because the I is always in a sort of story about things. We're talking about narratives where the I has all kinds of narratives that it identifies with. And we all do all the time. We have to. It's a di discipline to learn at moments not to. OK, so I need. I need. OK, so the I that's dreaming this in this dream feels a, a real need to do something, right? I need to cross a river. River. See, the other thing about dream work is likening. It's, it's metaphorizing. It's, you know, well, this is like, 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 like. I talk about echo, so what I mean is echoing. It's, this has got to echo. This is crossing a river is like, well, in ordinary language, we say, you know, um, i got to get to the other side of this problem. Um, cross over the bridge, there's a song, right? At least back in my day. Cross over the bridge, you know? No, it's probably too far gone. <laughs> it was back in the 50s or something, you know? Uh, to get to the other side of the stream of life, the stream of life, that sort of metaphor comes up a lot. Life as a stream. Ego needs to cross over, but... And this is the drama, right? But there is no bridge. There's no way across. Now, in Freud, one of the interesting things about depth psychological thinking from the very beginning is that there's no such thing as but. If you mention it, it's there. So and and but are kind of the same thing. But is a kind of you know ego construction to make a tension. If it appears in a dream, it's there. You know, you can say, oh, no, I'm not angry at you. Well, why'd you bring up anger then? It's there, you know? Or, no, I'm not falling in love with you. Hmm. Why did that word even come up, <laughs> right? OK, so but and. It's just, it, it links within the dream. There is no bridge. So bridge across from one side to the other. Bridge across some sort of problem in life, some sort of situation. Um, get to the other side. Trolls live under the bridge. In any oops, mythology went, but the list on here, if anybody goes into mythology, you get into trolls and things that live in that, that uh, transition place underneath it. Under the bridge. Now we have homeless guys under the bridge. A uh, frightening place to live. And yet, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting that they live under the bridge. <laughs> I think about it. I mean, that's an interesting, we'd call it amplification in the Jungian world. Yeah, they live at that transition point. 
That's an important point. Okay, there's no bridge, so I can't get to the other side of this, this problem, this love situation, this work difficulty, this, I can't get to the other side of this bloody thing. Farther down, there's a bridge. Farther down is like what? Farther down in the body, farther down in time, farther down below, getting into more depth, farther down. I think there's a bridge, or well, I guess he sees there's a bridge, but, there we go, but it leads only to an island. That only, that's typical ego talk. Because the ego's dumb. I mean, I mean, we, we love our egos, <laughs> and it's necessary, um, I guess, to have an, you know, to take a position and, and, and make our life simple. Otherwise, we couldn't live. There'd be too much stuff going on, too many levels, too much metaphor, too much uh, multiplicity, too much. But it simplifies beyond what's real and deep. It always does that as does either or thinking, which is what we're seeing right now in politics. Another one of those huge simplifiers. It's either this or it's that. No, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's this. Now work with that. To work with that, we need to be much more subtle. And that's also what this method is trying to help us develop by getting away from our own egos and positions for a moment. See, if I ruled the world, have a, <laughs> my tr this is a game I like to play. It's my Trump game. <laughs> if I were in charge of everything, everything in the world, um, I would teach kids at some age, and I need some help with those of you who know more about kids and education, uh, to play the other. So that, so that what, what our kids learn, are educated to do, practice doing, is changing roles. Being this, or being this, or being that. So we're not so bloody fixed in our identities. See, everybody's talking about identity nowadays, so this is an important thing. Come on, what did we do before we had identities? I mean, we didn't used to talk about identity all the time. I've had fights with people over this, even at a university, Meridian. I had a big fight on a panel about identity. It's, it's something that psychology grabs hold of these days and hangs on to. No, we don't need fixed identities. We need the ability to shift and look from the other side, from the other side, and come up with novel, new ideas, conclusions. Conclusions is probably too strong a word. But something that fits with the complexity that we're learning about with complexity theory, quantum physics, with all the experiments, the cosmological things that we're learning about, fascinating ways to look at things, not from one perspective, but let say even from, you know, the speed of light. <laughs> Sitting on the train at the speed of light, things look different than they do if you look at it from here, from here, from here. That's what we need training in, I think, if I ran the world. If I ran the world, I'd put this in all the schools. I'd have us doing it all the time. So that what we were learning was ego flexibility. What we were learning was oh, empathy, yeah. Empathy. I mean, that's how you get to empathy, by crawling in. What's the old thing? Somebody else's moccasins. Heck yeah. Compl crawling into their reality, crawling into their life, and talking from there, feeling from there. That's what's interesting. Actually, that is, that's what's rich and interesting. That's, what, that's, what, that's connected with soul. That's what gives soul, gives meaning. All right, so with this dream, um, so if we bracket out the ego, if we bracket out the contrasts that the ego is made up, if we bracket out the only, which is the ego's narrowness of perspective, only, nothing is ever an only. I mean, if things are, you think metaphorically, you think mythically, things are more than. 
You think in terms of the sparks in events, the excitement, Jim would, my the ex, Hillman, <laughs> would say, uh, what would he say? The, the it, anima, an animated world, the angels in events. You know, there, I mean, there's whole groups of people who, who see, saw how alive the world was. You know, a little spark in a blade of grass. <laughs> it sounds like Walt Whitman, right? A, uh, the world's alive. The world's alive if we see it. Actually, we're finding that more and more now. In biology, we're finding it in the sciences. We are finding how alive and extraordinarily interconnected it is. Way beyond anything we ever, we ever knew. Okay, and then, so, to an island. Now, that's a weird thing because we don't think uh, that we agree with islands because nowadays we tr like to talk about being interconnected and relational and all those things, which I talk about, too. They're extremely important. But in this psyche, at this moment, this is where the dream goes. And so what we've got to challenge ourselves to imagine is... Um, what state, what emotional state is this that is necessary? Let's say this is my dream. I have people in my classes say, if this were my dream, then they can start imagining into it without you know, telling the other person what their dream is supposed to be about. <laughs> I'm, I'm the only one that does that. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but they, they you know, get mad at me. Um, so if it were... My dream, it leads only to an island. Oh my God, you mean I have to be all alone, you know? Oh my God, you mean, you mean I gotta <laughs> learn how to talk to a coconut shell? Or to, what was the movie where Tom Hanks picked up, the, was it a coconut shell? <laughs> yeah, or, or volleyball, oh it was even better. Wilson, the volleyball, yeah. Well, do you see what that did for him to have to get that creative on a nowhere island where he was just existing, learning to talk to a Wilson? So, so you see, our prejudices, and, and in this case, it would be um, all the best people I know believe in relational thinking. So it's crossing our own prejudice and saying, now, just a minute, in this, this dream takes you to another place even from what you thought was the most important value in the world right now. Well, I still think it's the most important value in the world, but not at this moment in this psyche. And so if this is my patient, I'm going to, you know, I might not even talk about this dream with him, but I would certainly know that going into island level is the thing for them to be doing. That's, that's where the dream goes. I mean, I tend to take the dream as a reality and give it that dignity, because that gets you out of the ego. So if, if my patient, those of you who are, uh, how many of you have anything to do with patients or, you know? No, okay, but the rest of you can imagine. Um, wants to rush into the next relationship, wants to rush into some other acting out kind of thing, you know? Wants to, because they want to keep their life moving, their life moving, it's not the right moment. Not right now, according to this dream. Okay, so that was just an example. Okay, here's a dream fresh, fresh out of somebody's mouth. I call it the baby elephant dream. Okay, this guy says in his dream, a baby elephant came into his apartment. And he was so, he was, he was horrified because what he realized was that baby elephant, which is very cute right now, a little baby elephant, is going to grow up to be a great big elephant and is going to fall through the floor of the apartment, and apartment or house or something, I think apartment, and destroy the whole place. So that's where the dream ends, in that kind of conflict. Okay, you think about that metaphorically, 
if you also think about elephants, See, I like, you know, I'm trained as a Jungian, but I like to do most of my amplification through uh, looking at real animals and their behaviors, as well as the stories about them, because it used to be all the same. You know, the, the people who made up myths and symbols and so on about animals, like an elephant, they were also living very close to elephants watching elephants, seeing elephants, training elephants, being with elephants, learning elephant behavior, how elephants behave with other elephants. Now we get all that from the Nature Channel. It's really very cool. I mean, we should I go into that or should I? Just from the architecture of the dream, where's the ego? Ego's afraid that his place is going to fall apart. Now, what about the, what I call Laird rule? John Laird, the guy that my husband knew. Everything's right in the dream except the dream ego. Oh, that means you've got to imagine in a way that's counter to your natural way of manage, imagining and natural sense of reality. Maybe metaphorically, metaphorically, this huge elephant does have to fall through the existing floor. Maybe this guy is afraid of becoming who he can be. Maybe who this guy can be is an elephant. An elephant has got a mind, like an incredible, an incredible mind. Uh, th that's why they're sometimes called, you know, a symbol of wisdom. Um, my, an elephant has an incredible memory. You know, I was in India one time and uh, did a stupid thing. I followed the signs that said, we'll take you on a ride in the elephant through the jungle. And I thought, oh, wouldn't that be interesting to ride on an elephant? They took me to this place where this guy lived, at, you know, with a great big concrete thing that he kept his elephant in, which obviously he, that's what he made a living, you know, by taking people on these rides. The elephants all chained up and I went over and uh, looked in the eye of the elephant, that creature was me. I mean, that was an eye of intelligence. Elephants are, f he, he met my, he or she or whatever he, it was, met my gaze and absolutely freaked me out. It was real. I, I went on with the ride, but I've never gotten over it. Because this was a real, this was a real thing. I mean, we know now that, that elephants mourn. We know that there's a, the wisdom tradition has to do with old age because they live to such old age. So the oldest female in the tribe is the matriarch. And she knocks around the other elephants. Or if there's an elephant that can't take care of its little baby, I know this from the nature channel, right? can't take of its little, uh, care of its little baby, she knocks that mother, mother out of the way and picks up the baby <laughs> with her trunk, hits it in the rear end, and it staggers along, you know, for a little bit longer. Of course, there's also time to let them die. That's also part of animal, elephant, and every animal just about we know except us, behavior. Because it's, it's close to nature. It's what nature does and has to do sometimes. But that moment of respect for the elephant makes me actually envy this guy's dream. That's for that, I mean, that's like a gift. That elephant to walk into his place. And of course he's afraid of it. Who wouldn't be afraid if you know it's going to break eventually? It's going to break down your whole place and you're going to have to grow into the size of your mind, the size of your being. Terrifying. Terrifying. Yet another dream. While we're on this, we still have a few minutes, and then I'll leave time again for questions, okay? Uh, the other dream was, I call it the smoking dream. Did you get the, you got the elephant dream. You look like you're getting it all, actually. A lot of you are going like that. And this is not easy stuff. I mean, this isn't, the, this isn't the easy way of thinking. You're all thinking imaginatively. 
those of you who are nodding, you're getting it. This is where we've got to go. This is how we can fill things out. This is how we can make life richer and better for everybody we teach. This kind of a broadening of imagination, too. Okay, here's the uh, smoking dream. He was, um, <laughs> he said, this is a stupid dream. <laughs> Whenever they say this is a stupid dream, it's not a stupid dream. Or this is a, just, a, just a tiny dream. This is a tiny dream. He was sitting in a cafe, and this kind of macho guy comes in smoking and sits down at his table. So he just sits there. Next scene, he finds himself <laughs> going into the a convenience store and buying a pack of cigarettes. And then he realizes, my God, I have never smoked in my life. I hate smoke. I'm not <laughs> about to begin smoking. I mean, this is a guy in his 40s, late 40s. Um, so he leaves the, the package of cigarettes on the counter and um, leaves. So that was the dream. Um, who's the dream ego? The dream ego's the guy sits, so in this case, it's better to look at it in a sort of Jungian lens. The guy who walks in is what Jung calls a shadow figure, right? I mean, Jung um, defines shadow most broadly as anything of your own gender back when gender mattered, <laughs> which it must still because we do have dreams of, you know, I mean, it feels different when a guy walks in and it feels different when a woman walks in. We don't know why. It, you know, it's good not to define it and it's good not to define what the differences are. Just stay with the feeling. So everything of your own gender, Jung says, is, is a shadow, except for a couple archetypal things like father or something like that. That means, and, and unfortunately, the way that's been interpreted in much of the Jungian world is that the shadow's a, a bad thing. The shadow was much worse back at the beginning of the last century because everybody was into a kind of persona. I mean, it was the beginning of Freud, it was the beginning of depth psychology. It was the beginning of a time when um, a lot of stuff had been repressed that people were terrified of. And so what do you repress? You don't repress the part you're proud of. You repress the part that you're not proud of, you know, that you do terrible things. So that makes sense. However, it, this is time. At this time, it's really important to have the broader sense of shadow because it fills out the possibilities, the personality right there. It's right there with you. Okay, so there he is sitting, this non-smoking guy, and this macho guy comes in smoking. What is that about? Enough to catch him such that, such that, you know, internally, psychologically, that he wants to go out and buy a pack of cigarettes and then leaves them because he comes to his senses. How many of you have ever smoked? Oh, good. <laughs> good. I'm always, I'm so embarrassed to tell people how long I smoked, for how many years, from the time I was about 12, because I was a juvenile delinquent, <laughs> until, uh, until about 25 years ago. Uh, I thank God I'm off, it, it, I, tr I tried to quit five times. And, you know, and I went to all these groups and I wore wristbands and I did all these things to try to keep myself from smoking. My problem, or one of my problems, was it, well, it was tied in with everything. It, writing, thinking. I could not sit at a typewriter, because that's how you wrote in those days, typewriter. I couldn't sit at a typewriter without a cigarette. I couldn't think without a cigarette. I couldn't... So I finally had to, on that fifth time quitting, I had to stop thinking and say, okay, I'm taking a year off. I don't have to write. I don't have to uh, think. I don't have to do anything because it's, that's what it's going to take. And then it's what it took. It take, took actually about two years. And I gained tons of weight and, you know, I mean, hmm, hmm. I haven't lost it. <laughs> but, and, and finally my mind came back that didn't have to have 
smoke between me and the heavens, which is a kind of key because I spent a heck of a long time thinking about smoking, thinking about what is this thing? What, it, what makes this so essential to thinking for me? And I, so I thought of Native American things. I thought of rituals of smoke going up into the realm of spirit, connect to me. Oh, by, that's the way I think. I mean, for me, that had to do with being able to have ideas. And the stem, I was connected to this thing up here, which helped me write papers and get those ideas down. So to stop, so, so, it's a, so what I'm saying is it's like a, it's a mythological, it's a ritualistic, it's a very real thing. I just had made an addiction a bit out of it, which we, you know, we tend to do in our tradition and other traditions too, actually. You know, I've been to Egypt and seen the guy sit around with the pipe and pass it around, you know, with some sort of, I forget what in it, but certainly something that keeps you from working. <laughs> but but, but with the I, I mean, there you could just w walk down and watch. These guys, it was, they were communing, they were connecting. It was all these guys in the village. And that's how they did it. They did it through that. Well, I used to connect through smoking, too. Anywhere I went to, all the miscreants went outside to smoke, and we had the most interesting conversations. And it was all the people that were kind of like me, you know, kind of heck with the rules people. Okay. So with that long amplification, um, it seems to me that's how... Mythic thinking is relevant. Ritualistic thinking is relevant right now, all the time. With addictions, with behavior, all kinds of things. The thing is just to get to what, you know, what it's actually doing. People say, well, it's blocking the pain. Well, there are a lot of ways to block pain. I think it's different if you're, if you're you know, swigging a vodka all day long. If, you're, if it's drink, that's a different kind of image, another a kind of oceanic situation, Freud would say, you know, versus smoke, you know. Um, you, you know, nowadays, <laughs> marijuana is legal. legal. Now, so far, it seems like it does different things with different people, but it's certainly a reconnection with that kind of smoke phenomena. I'd study all that. If I were a student here at Pacifica, I'd look into all that, and I'd do a lot of research <laughs> about it and find what are the fantasies going on with that, what are the, the, physical, or the physical part of it, and so on and so forth. What's it doing? How's it helping? Why we've made it legal all over, so something in us has opened the door to say, maybe this will help with our problem. Maybe this will help with our ability to move to the next iteration of things to transform something that needs to be transformed because God knows it, uh, it does. But I think, and certainly Pacifica thinks, that this, this kind of thinking is key to finding those ways of reading the culture and trying to help the culture in whatever ways we do. And, and by the way, this this dream stuff that I'm doing, um, it's like t it's by getting the ego out of the way, it's uh, it's serving the other. It's serving what's not me, which is like serving the world. Only it's an interior mode because that's what I do most. Very important to get the ego out of it and relativized. Okay, on that note, questions or comments or, yes. So my personal definition of ego is a belief that I exist as a separate entity. Uh-huh. Okay, I've also come to also understand that that is also an illusion. Okay, that really, there is no other, because you are me. 
you are that elephant, and you are me, and you are everyone. But we just believe that we're separate. It's a thought. So what if, like, the whole ego thing, is that, that's a myth. <laughs> well, it's an important thought. It's an important thought, just because it's not the whole story. It, it, it's a very important thought, like at two years old, developmentally. Yeah, two it's years old, that's when it starts. Uh, no, 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 yeah. no, no, no. That's important for the development of a child, you know, to think, I can say no, and I don't have to do it. You know, that's important. Teenagers going through another level of ego identity development saying, screw you, parents. I listen to my friends as though that were individuating. But <laughs> <laughs> it's a step. It's a step away from home. And, and that's important. So we can't say the, these ego moments aren't important. They are important but they're just one little part of the story. We've made it into the whole story. And it's all a story, though, everything. I mean, yeah. We're, inter we're interconnected with... Yeah, but this, this work now, we're dreaming together. What if this is a dream, too? And the only difference between this one and the sleeping one is in this one, there's, there's a sense of continuity, you know, from mm -hmm. yesterday's dream and today's, and, mm -hmm. and there's time and space, and the sleeping not doesn't exist in the sleeping one, and there does appear to be existing right. in this one. And right. You know, what if it's all a dream, though? You know, it's so, fine with so, me. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I mean, we're doing fine. I don't know. It just it just seems to like a lot of the talk about the ego seems to build it. You know what I mean? Well, I know that's why I want to just bracket it out a bit more. Or the idea of identity, because the whole field has grabbed hold of that as though they were saying something. We're, I mean, it, and maybe there are moments when we are. I mean, maybe there are moments where somebody needs to cohere um, psychologically and stand for something. I mean, there, there certainly are moments. I, actually, I'm working with a person right now for whom that is hard. What I find with that person I'm working with is that there's a lot of inflation in the way. I mean, it's like she um, she worries about what others will say. She worries about making others mad. She worries that people will stop loving her. Well, so what? I mean, our job, our job is not to run around asking people to love us. I mean, our job is to do what we're supposed to be doing, you know, which could be taking care of your family, could be seeing to your child, could be marching out there in picket lines, could be organizing resistance, could be a whole bunch of different kinds of things. It's not about you. So, and w so what I say to her, and she hates me for it, but she'd been with me for a thousand years, so uh, is it's not about you. It's not about you. What do you mean you can't make the phone? It's not about you. It's about this project that you're doing. Or it's about this paper you have to write. It's about this. It's, about, it's not about you. It's about service. I mean, everything we do is a form of service. Reimagine it that way. I mean, that's getting the gods back into it. It's a form of serving. That's what archetypal psychology was about in the beginning, you know, uh, serving the gods. And we, we took the gods then very literally and named them all and so on and, you know, pretended there were 12 or something. No, we never did that, but some people. Uh, but, but, but if you take those gods a bit more subtly and if you say, you know, what life is about is serving things that are more than you, bigger than you, that's actually a great joy, and it actually connects you and makes you bigger and more powerful. So, thank you for your question. That's my final word on the topic, because I'm Donald Trump now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.